Illustrated Police News Portrait of Fanny Adams Fanny Adams was an eight-year-old English girl who was murdered by solicitor's clerk Frederick Baker in Alton, Hampshire, on August 24, 1867. The murder itself was extraordinarily brutal and caused a national outcry in the United Kingdom. Fanny was abducted by Baker and taken into a hop garden near her home, where she was brutally murdered and dismembered, some parts were never found. Further investigations suggested that two small knives were used for the murder, but it was later ruled they would have been insufficient to carry out the crime and that another weapon must have been used. Used to express total downtime or inaction, the military, manual trade and locker room talk phrase Sweet Fanny Adams has been in use since at least the mid-20th century, vying with a stronger expletive. Unusually, the phrase is not a balderization. Fanny Adams arrived in 1860s naval slang to describe the new tin meat which was of dubious provenance. It broadened to mean anything badly substandard, then further so as to merge with the expletive sharing its initial letters to mean nothing at all. The phrase also appears today as sweet F.A. Fanny Adams and her family lived in Tanhouse Lane, on the northern side of Alton, a market town in Hampshire, England. The 1861 census shows that Fanny lived with her father and five siblings. The family were apparently locally rooted, a George Adams and his wife Anne, believed to have been Fanny's grandparents, lived next door. Fanny was described as being a tall, comely and intelligent girl. She appeared older than her real age of eight and was known locally for her lively and cheerful disposition. Fanny's best friend, Minnie Warner, was the same age and lived next door but one in Tanhouse Lane. The town of Alton was renowned for its plentiful supply of hops, which led to many breweries opening in the town and made hop picking an integral part of its economy until the mid-20th century. To the northern end of Tanhouse Lane lies Flood Meadow and surrounding the riverway, which sometimes flooded the area in times of heavy rain. A large hop garden was located next to the meadow. An illustration of Fanny Adams' abduction by Illustrated Police News. Alton had previously seen no serious crime during the 19th century. The afternoon of August 24, 1867 was reported as fine, sunny and hot. It was around this time that Fanny, along with her sister Lizzie and best friend Minnie Warner, asked her mother Harriet Adams if she could go out to the nearby flood meadow. Having no objections and being pleased for the girls to leave her while she was getting on with housework, Harriet agreed. Fanny and the local children had often played in Flood Meadow, owing to its close proximity to Tanhouse Lane and the fact that there had been little crime in Alton within living memory. As the girls were walking towards Flood Meadow and into a hop garden, they met Frederick Baker, a 29-year-old solicitor's clerk. He was wearing a frock coat, light-colored trousers and a tall hat. Baker had moved from his former home in Guilford to work and live in Alton about 12 months prior. He was employed by solicitor Mr. Clements whose office was situated in Alton High Street, opposite the Swan Hotel, a hostelry which Baker would frequent. Baker gave Minnie and Lizzie three halfpence to spend on sweets and Fanny another halfpenny. The girls had seen Baker before at church meetings, and were thus unconcerned about taking money from him. Baker then watched the girls run up and down the hollow as they played and ate the blackberries he had picked for them. An hour later, Lizzie and Minnie decided that they had had enough and opted to go home. Baker then approached Fanny and asked her to accompany him to Sheldon. Fanny refused, and it was then that Baker abducted her and carried her into the nearby hop garden. Lizzie and Minnie ran back to Tanhouse Lane, straight to Martha Warner. She ignored their story, so the girls carried on playing together, oblivious of Fanny's abduction. It was not until 5 p.m. that they made their way home for dinner. Mrs. Gardner, who also lived on Tanhouse Lane, noticed Fanny's absence and asked the girls her whereabouts. The children relayed what had occurred earlier in the day, and told Mrs. Gardner that Fanny had been taken away by Baker. Mrs. Gardner then relayed the information to Fanny's mother Harriet and the two women set off to search for her. They met with Baker after going only a short distance, near a gate separating the hop garden from Flood Meadow. According to the Hampshire Chronicle, Mrs. Gardner asked Baker what he had done with the child. Baker assured her that he often gave money to children for buying sweets. Mrs. Gardner replied, I have a great mind to give you in charge of the police, to which Baker told her she could do what she liked. Baker's position in town as the solicitor's clerk initially deflected any suspicions the two women had. Both returned to their homes believing Fanny was still playing in one of the surrounding fields. Sometime between 7 o'clock and 8 p.m., Fanny had still not returned home, prompting Harriet and a group of neighbors to search for the missing child. As the evening was setting, the group began the search in the hollow to no success. In the nearby hop garden, however, laborer Thomas Gates found Fanny's head stuck on two hop poles while he was tending to the crops. 
Fanny's ear had been severed from the head, which had two large cuts from mouth to ear across the temple. Further investigation discovered the remains of the child, the head, arms and legs were separated from the trunk. There were three incisions on the left side of the chest, and a deep cut on the left arm, dividing her muscles. Fanny's forearm was cut off at the elbow joint, and her left leg nearly severed off at the hip joint, with her left foot cut off at the ankle point. Her right leg was torn from the trunk, and the whole contents of her pelvis and chest were completely removed. Five further incisions had been made on the liver. Her heart had been cut out, and her vagina was missing. Both of her eyes were cut out, and found in the nearby riverway. Overwhelmed with grief, Harriet collapsed on her way to inform her husband, who was playing cricket at the time, so word was sent instead. When George was told the details he returned home to take his loaded shotgun and set out to look for the culprit, but neighbors stopped him and instead sat with him through the night. The next day hundreds of people visited the hop garden to help collect Fanny's scattered remains. The police tried, unsuccessfully, to find the murder weapons, as they suspected that small knives were used to commit the crime. It is likely that the crowd of searchers had inadvertently trampled down any clues left on the ground. They did, however, recover all of Fanny's cut clothing, scattered around the field, with the exception of her hat. Most of Fanny's body parts were collected on that day, but an arm, foot, and intestines were not found until the next morning. One foot was still in a shoe, and still clutched in one hand were the two halfpence that Baker had given to Fanny. The breastbone was never found. Fanny's remains were taken to the doctor's surgery, located in Amory Street, for an autopsy to be carried out. The surgery was later converted to a Punlick house, ye old leathern bottle and is now a private residence. Fanny's body parts were sewn together, only yards away from her home. From there officers of Hampshire Constabulary took them to the local police station. A stone which still had flesh and hair sticking to it was handed into the police as evidence, as they thought it may have been the actual murder weapon. The leathern bottle, where Fanny's remains were collected and reassembled. That evening, Police Superintendent William Cheney hurried from the police station to Flood Meadow, where he was met by several people, who then led him to the leathern bottle. Upon arrival, the proprietor of the house handed Cheney a bundle labeled portions of a child, and with the help of some of his officers, organized a search to trace the missing body parts. Hearing that Baker had been seen with the children prior to Fanny's disappearance, Cheney retraced his steps through the town and located Baker's place of work. Arriving at the solicitor's office at 9 p.m., he found Baker still at work, an hour later than usual. Baker protested, claiming his innocence, despite being informed that he was the only suspect. Cheney had no alternative but to arrest Baker on suspicion of murder. By this time, a large and agitated crowd had gathered outside the solicitor's office, forcing the police to smuggle Baker out the back door for fear that the mob would kill him. When searched at the police station, Baker was found to be in possession of two unstained small knives. Spots of blood were observed on both wristbands of his shirt, and his trousers had been soaked to conceal the blood stains. After being questioned about his appearance, Baker responded, Well, I don't see a scratch or cut on my hands to account for the blood. Baker's conduct during his interrogation was described as cool and collected. Sometime after the arrest, Cheney backtracked to Baker's desk in the solicitor's office, and discovered a diary among some legal papers. An entry had been made for Saturday August 24, 1867 which recorded, killed a young girl. It was fine and hot. The Hampshire Chronicle reported that the hop garden had been cleared on 21st of September, but nothing connected with the murder had been found. It also added that Baker remained completely unfazed with the murder, and did not exhibit any symptoms of insanity or remorse. Further confusion was added when Baker stated that he was intoxicated after seeing the children, all evidence and witnesses rejected his claim. Baker was transferred to Winchester Prison on 19th of October. Following investigations from Hampshire Constabulary continued until October. It was around this time when a young boy, whose parents lived close to the Adams family, came forward as an eyewitness. The boy testified that he saw Baker emerge from the hop garden at about 2 p.m. on the day Fanny was murdered, with his hands and clothes saturated with blood. Baker then reportedly stooped down to the river and calmly wiped himself with a handkerchief, after which he put a small knife and another unidentified object in his jacket pocket. The boy had related this story to his mother at that time, but she had not told anyone until she spoke out in a pub two months later. The police searched the whole area for 16 days, but no other weapons were found. Cheney requested an immediate forensic test in late October. All recovered clothing, 
and the two knives taken from Baker at the time of his arrest, were sent to Professor A. S. Taylor at Guy's Hospital in London, where they received the most detailed test possible for the period. After examining the items over the coming weeks, Taylor was able to confirm that the blood on the knives was human. One of the small knives contained a small amount of coagulated blood, although none was on the handle. Under cross-examination, Taylor stated he would have expected more blood on the knives and signs of rust if they had been washed. The quantity of blood found, however, was surprisingly small. However, Taylor opined that an inexperienced person armed with a proper weapon could dismember a body in about half an hour, blood would still run but would not have spurted from the body. Further examination of Baker's clothes uncovered some small traces of diluted blood in some parts of his waistcoat, trousers and stockings. The wristbands of his shirt had been folded back and diluted blood stained the folds. There was no sign of rape on the body. Dr. Lewis Leslie from Alton thought Fanny's ultimate cause of death was probably by a blow to the head with a stone. Leslie speculated that a larger instrument had to have been used to cut the body, and also added that dismemberment was achieved in less than an hour. Forensics indicated that cuts had been made when the body was still warm, and that Fanny had not only been cut but also hacked and torn to pieces. The time it had taken Baker to cut the body into so many pieces most likely gave him the opportunity to choose his positioning so that he might not necessarily be covered in blood. The forensic staff in London concluded that the small knives found in Baker's possession would not have been capable of severing Fanny's body, so another weapon had to have been used. Meanwhile, in Winchester Prison, Baker was said to be talkative to the wardens and especially the chaplain. He still insisted that his conscience was clear with regards to the murder and wondered who the guilty party was, hoping that he would be found. Baker ate and slept well, which was in contrast to his time in Alton's prison, where he was reportedly disturbed in his sleep and physically shuddered at the sight of meat. English law at the time required that in the case of sudden death, an immediate inquest had to be held under the jurisdiction of a coroner. In the case of Fanny Adams' inquest, Deputy County Coroner Robert Harfield was in charge of the proceedings which were held at the Duke's Head in an Alton on August 27, 1867. Cheney was in attendance along with Acting Chief Constable Superintendent Everett, who was representing Hampshire Constabulary. Coincidentally, the pub where the initial trials were held was very close to the police station, which is now the site of a fire station. The first to give evidence was Minnie Warner, who told the jury that Baker had given her money to run down the hollow with Fanny and into a nearby field while he picked blackberries for them. She was unable to identify Baker but correctly described what he was wearing when he murdered Fanny. The next to testify was Fanny's mother, Harriet, who recalled that she met Baker at the gate to the hop garden and that he was headed towards the road which led to Basingstoke. It was there Minnie identified Baker as the man who gave her the pennies. Baker contradicted Minnie at the time by saying no, three halfpence. When asked by Harriet to give his name, Baker refused but told her where he could be found. Mrs. Gardner, who had accompanied Harriet to search for the missing girl, gave evidence next. She was able to identify Baker and told the jury that he appeared to be very relaxed at the time she saw him. After asking him if he had seen the missing child and inquiring why he had given her money, Mrs. Gardner told Harriet that she should give him in charge to the police, to which Baker calmly responded, the reason why I speak so is that an old gentleman has been giving halfpence to the children for no good purpose. And I thought you were of the same sort. After being asked again of Fanny's whereabouts, Baker said that he left her at the gate to play. The coroner asked Baker if he wanted to cross-question the witness, but he declined. The inquest concluded that Baker was responsible for the murder of Fanny Adams, and he was committed to Winchester Jail to await trial. The trial took place at Winchester on 5th of December. The defense contested Minnie's identification of Baker and claimed the knives found were too small for the crime anyway. They also argued insanity, Baker's father had been violent, a cousin had been in asylums, his sister had died of a brain fever and he himself had attempted suicide after a love affair. The defense also argued that the diary entry was typical of the epileptic or formal way of entry that the defendant used and that the absence of a comma after the word killed did not render the entry a confession. Justice Meller invited the jury to consider a verdict of not responsible by reason of insanity, but they returned a guilty verdict after just 15 minutes. On 24th of December, Christmas Eve, Baker was hanged outside Winchester Prison. The crime had become notorious and a crowd of 5,000 attended the execution. This was the last public execution held at that prison. Before his death, Baker wrote to the Adamses expressing his sorrow for what he had done in an unguarded hour and seeking their forgiveness. Following his execution, Baker's death mask was made, 
and the following year his full figure was placed as an exhibit in the Chamber of Horrors at Madame Tussaud's famous waxworks in London. Fanny was buried in Alton Cemetery. The headstone, erected by voluntary subscription, reads, Sacred to the memory of Fanny Adams aged eight years and four months who was cruelly murdered on Saturday August 24, 1867. Fear not them which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Matthew 10 v 28. Fanny Adams' grave in Alton Cemetery in 1869, new rations of tin mutton were introduced for British seamen. They were unimpressed by it and suggested it might be the butchered remains of Fanny Adams. Fanny Adams became slang for mediocre mutton, stew, scarce leftovers and then anything worthless. The large tins the mutton was delivered in doubled as mess tins. These or cooking pots are still known as fannies. By the mid-20th century, many working-class men were pretending to their sons and social superiors that their own favorite expression, sweet F.A., stood for sweet. Fanny Adams with its commonplace meaning of total inaction or downtime, while they and their peers used that expression among themselves to mean sweet fuck all. Sweet Fanny Adams has lingered as a euphemism for that expletive. Thanks for watching.